Hi, my name is Yong Chen Huang, and I'm a pharmatox reviewer in the Division of Clinical Review in the Office of Bioequivalence within OGD. So today, my topic is local toxicity considerations for qualifying excipients in generic drugs. Before I dive deep into the presentation, I'll have the disclaimer first. So this presentation reflects the views of the author and should not be construed to represent FDA's views or policies. Uh, in this talk, we have three learning object objectives. The first is to introduce the concept of local safety assessment of excipients in generic drugs. The second is to illustrate the key aspects of excipient local safety review. And the third is to provide review cases to demonstrate how safety information, data gaps, and the context of use impact our recommendations. So for safety assessment of excipients, there are two FDA guidances that we can rely on. The first one is non-clinical studies for the safety evaluation of pharmaceutical excipients. This guidance provides general rules for excipients in generic drugs. For example, the guidance states that the generic drugs intended for parenteral, ophthalmic, or otic use should contain the same excipients in the same concentrations at the IOD, with the, with the exception of buffers, antioxidants, and the preservatives. And for other routes of administration, there is no such requirement. So the second guidance is good and submission practices. This guidance provides more details on when and applicants need to provide a safety justification for excipients. So this guidance states that excipients in generic drugs should have a well-defined safety profile for the proposed context of use. And the context of use includes route of administration, which is a key determining factor for local safety assessment. So in a nutshell, these two FDA documents give us guidance that uh, generic drugs should have the same ingredients, strength, dosage form, route of administration, and the conditions of use as compared to the IOD. Generic drugs, however, could have differences in excipients, impurities, etc. Generic drugs need to demonstrate bioequivalence to the IOD drugs. Although there is no requirement for clinical safety studies in development of generic drugs, applicants do need to, prove, to provide data to prove that the generic drugs have a similar safety profile as IOD drugs. Um, there are a few key aspects in assessing the safety of excipients in generic drugs. First, um, we conduct safety review of excipients on a console basis, and the safety review is a joint effort between the clinical team and the pharmatox team within DCR. Second, in safety assessment of excipients, context of use is critical. Context of use includes dose, particularly the, the maximum daily dose. Rotor administration, is it oral, parenteral, or topical? Duration of use, is it acute, subchronic, or chronic? And the patient population, is it used in children or even in neonates? And third, in addition to systemic toxicity, we assess local toxicity of excipients in some cases, because some generic products have a continuous exposure at the site of administration. So on the next slide, I'll elaborate on why we need to conduct safety assessment on local toxicity of excipients. So why do we care about the local toxicity of excipients? The answer is simple, because excipients could cause local toxicity at the site of administration, such as irritation and sensitization. And some tissues in our body are more sensitive to local toxicity. Uh, if such tissues are exposed to a drug product, we need to pay attention to local toxicity. As I mentioned before, route of administration is a key determining factor for assessment of local toxicity. For example, the buccal route, by which a drug formulation is attached to the mu buccal mucosa continuously. Some other routes that require considerations of local safety assessment include the intramuscular and the subcutaneous, ophthalmic, topical, rectal, and the vaginal. So for the oral route, a specific dosage form may determine whether there is a need for local safety assess assessment. For example, gums, lozenges, ODT, and sublingual films have substantial exposure time 
in the oral cavity, which may lead to irritation and sensitization. So overall, safety assessment of local toxicity is done to ensure that a proposed product is similar to its IOD in terms of risk. Starting from the next slide, I'll present three cases with respect to local safety assessment of excipients in generic drugs. The first case is excipient A in a topical pollution. Um, first, the background information. So this is a topical lotion for short-term use, and the use can be repeated and or intermittent. The indicated populations include both pediatrics and adults. The RLD drugs does not contain this excipient A because this product is for topical use and the excipient A is not present in RLD. We need a safety justification for both systemic toxicity and local toxicity. So the applicant provided the following justification. First, the applicant provided the use of excipient A in marketed products, including prescribed drugs, over-the-counter drugs, and the cosmetics. Second, the applicant provided non-clinical toxicity data, including acute toxicity and dermal toxicity. However, data on genotoxicity toxicity and repeated dose toxicity were not provided. In addition, the applicant pointed out that uh, the drug product, product could cause skin irritation in human according to RD leveling. So the review team, including both clinicians and pharmatox reviewers, made the following determination. First, at the maximum, maximum daily intake, excipient A is a skin irritant and allergen. At 10% of the proposed MDI, excipient A is an eyewit irritant because the drug product is a lotion that can be used on head. There is a risk for eye exposure and, ex and irritation in the eyes. Therefore, excipient A poses a safety concern to both skin and eyes in the context of use of the drug product. Second, excipient A can increase the dermal penetration of other chemicals. Therefore, presence of excipient A may increase systemic exposure of the API and third, systemic overexposure to API may cause adverse effects such as metabolic dysregulation and neurotoxicity, particularly in young children. Therefore, on a worst case scenario, based on the three points listed above, uh, excipient A could worsen the adverse effects caused by the API, including local irritation on the skin and in the eyes, uh, systemic uh, toxicities such as the metabolic dysregulation and the neurotoxicity. So because of the safety concerns discussed above, we recommended the applicant to either remove excipient A and reformulate the product, or the applicant can provide additional data to show that proposed level of excipient A does not affect safety of the product. The second case is uh, excipient B in the vaginal cream. Um, first, the background information. So this is a, a vaginal cream for repeated intermittent use in non-pregnant women. This IOD does not contain excipient B. Now, because the drug product is for vaginal use and the excipient B is not present in IOD, we need a safety justification for both systemic toxicity and local toxicity. The applicant provided the following justification. First, the applicant provided the use of excipient B in the FDA approved drug products as listed in the IID database. Second, the applicant provided non-clinical data on both local and systemic toxicities. The toxicity data include dermal irritation and sensitization, genotoxicity, acute toxicity, repeated dose toxicity via the dermal and oral routes, and reproductive and developmental toxicity. Third, the applicant provided clinical safety data in literature that describe excipient B's dermal irritation and the sensitization effect. And finally, um, a single dose bioequivalence study of the end product with comparative clinical endpoints. So as you can see, the applicant submitted a, a whole lot of safety data of excipient B. So are those data enough to justify the excipient safe use in the context of use of the vaginal cream product. So here are the review team's uh, determination. First, 
there is no safety concern for systemic tox toxicity based on non-clinical data. Second, the CPMB is present in higher amounts in other FDA-approved products, including oral and dermal products. Third, literature, that literature data show that XCVMB did not cause irritation or sensitization in humans after repeated skin patch testing. And fourth, the bioequivalence study that the applicant relied on is a single-dose study, not a repeated-dose study. The local toxicity of XCVMB, including vaginal irritation and inflammation upon repeated and intermittent use, is not well characterized in the bioequivalence study. So therefore, uh, the conclusion is that there is uh, no safety concern on systemic toxicity. However, there is a data gap regarding the vaginal local safety of XCPMB. So the safety justification provided by the applicant is thus not sufficient to support safety of XCPMB via the vaginal route. So we recommended the applicant to conduct a non-clinical study to characterize the local safety of XCPMB by the vaginal route. Study outcomes should include evaluation of clinical signs, gross necropsy, vaginal histopathology, and the severity of irritation. So based on results of the rapid vaginal irritation study, the need for additional clinical safety data should be re revisited. However, if there is ever a need for additional clinical investigation, this drug cannot be submitted for approval as a generic drug as determined in the FDA guidance, determining whether to submit an ENDA or 505B2 application. So the third case is excipient C in the buccal film product. First, the background information. So this is the buccal film product for chronic use in adults. The product has different dose strength and the C is not present in the IOD. Now, because the drug product has long exposure to oral mucosa and the C is not present in the IOD, we need a safety justification for both systemic toxicity and local toxicity. So the applicant provided non-clinical data of XCPNC, uh, which include genotoxicity and systemic toxicity. Further, based on the NOAL value, of XCPNC in non-clinical studies, the applicant calculated a permissible daily exposure value for the excipient. However, a full toxicological study report was not provided to show how the NOVEL was determined. So um, there's a very limited amount of data provided by the applicant. Um, fortunately, after uh, spending some time doing research on this excipient, the review team was able to make the following determination. So first, um, the MDI of XCPNC needs to be recalculated based on practically feasible number of buccal films. The reason is that uh, we only have limited space in the mouth and only a certain amount of uh, buccal films can be applied each day depending on the size of the buccal films. Second, XCPNC is unlikely to be absorbed through the buccal mucosa due to its large molecular weight. Therefore, systemic exposure to this, to this excipient is expected to be very low. Third, excipient C did not cause irritation sensitization in non-clinical studies. Therefore, the likelihood of excipient C causing local irritation and sensitization is small. Fourth, excipient C has a wide safety margin based on non-clinical data suggesting that uh, the risk of systemic toxicity is low. And the fifth, similar grades in the sense of similar molecular weight and the chemical composition of XCPNC are present in FDA approved oral drug products at higher levels. So based on um, the determination listed above, we concluded that XCPNC does not pose a safety concern regarding either local toxicity or systemic toxicity in the context of use of the drug product. To summarize, um, the three case studies that are presented illustrated the key aspects of excipient safety review. The aspects are uh, safety justification for excipients in the generic formulation considers context of use of a proposed product. Dosage form determines the need for local safety assessment. 
local toxicity assessment is needed when there is a continuous exposure at the site of demonstration. Uh, safety justification can include clinical and non-clinical data in the format of study reports, publications, etc. And last but not least, four toxicological study reports are needed. Four study reports will help both ANA applicants and our reviewers. Just to reiterate what I have said before, so DCR evaluates the safety generics uh, and the safety profile of excipients are reviewed from both clinical and non-clinical standpoints. Both systemic and local toxicity of excipients are considered for certain dosage forms. There are two FDA guidances that we can rely on. So the goal of generic drug excipient safety review is to ensure that the generic formulation does not change the risk profile when compared with the RD. So here comes the fun part, the challenging question. So which one of the oral dosage forms does not require local safety assessment of excipients? A. Gum. B. Film coated tablet intended for swallowing. C. Orally disintegrating tablet or ODT. D. Sublingual films. So the answer is B. Film coated tablet intended for swallowing. Finally, I want to thank OGD management for the opportunity to present our work in DCR. I want to give thanks to my great colleagues in DCR. Particularly, I want to give the thanks to our leaders in the Pharmatox team, Dr. Robert Dawson, Xiu Tiking, and Richard Hopatlin, and the whole Pharmatox team. I also want to thank our colleagues in R&D who provided insightful opinions in some of the difficult cases we encountered. And thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions.